Hi there, Walker from Timberturn here. Welcome to the workshop. In this video, I make a live edge, slab top and table. I'm using macadamia for the top as I really like its end grain figure and dusting off the slab reveals the visible medullary rays. The timber is very prone to checking but has a beautiful pattern when sawn. I had wanted to use it for the legs as well, but borers had given the sticks I had a really good chew. So I abandoned that and went for camper laurel instead. I'm also stripping the bark off the legs to keep the top as the focal point of the piece. I want to keep the bark edge for the top, so I'm stabilizing it with epoxy before any machining. Once the bottom's taped up, I measure out the epoxy parts at a two to one ratio. And initially, they appear cloudy when combined, but are crystal clear once fully mixed. A small amount is then added to the cavities around the perimeter and into any voids in the main piece. The rough surface of the wood doesn't hold the tape very well, so this first pour really just seals the bottom for all of the subsequent pours. And with the bottom now sealed, all of the cavities in the piece can be filled up. The large void in the centre of the piece required several pores to fully fill, as going for too much in one go creates excessive heat and the epoxy can crack. It was after this second pour had set, I discovered a bubble had occurred late in the curing and had been cast in. So I had the brilliant idea of drilling down to the bubble to fill it on the next pour, but this wasn't a real bright idea. It initially looked all good, but there was still a hidden cavity in the slab that caused another bubble late in the next pour. The tape now comes off the bottom to ensure there's no loose bark and that the slab is fully stabilised. And with that confirmed, the flattening can now start. The rough chainsaw cuts and movement during drying mean the slab's all over the shop. This gets machined true using a custom made sled for the plunge route. The router sits in the sled with the cutter protruding and is passed across the top of the slab. To achieve flatness, the slab needs to be rigidly fixed in position on the flat reference surface. This is quickly accomplished with a stop block at each end and a spreading clamp applying compression at the centre of the piece. Though the slab's now firmly in place along this central axis, the uneven bottom usually allows for some rocking action. So this gets packed out to prevent any movement during cutting. This operation is always loud and dusty, so always wear the appropriate protective gear. By taking slow, sequential cuts, the slab bases end up flat and parallel. This flatness is referenced off the tabletop and transferred onto the slab surfaces via the cutter head. There's always plenty of dust to go around afterwards. Looking good, but there's still more cleaning up to go. The machine marks left from the cutter need to be sanded out. And a drum sander would be really handy here, but I've just got to give it the beans with what I've got. With the top mostly prepped, work can now start on the legs. The stick is cut down into three rough lengths of the drop saw, and two of these legs still have remnants of smaller branches attached. These are coming off and I'm creating a rounded end to show off the end grain, but also keep a natural type feel. This gets roughed out with files and then further refined with a shop made bow sander. The ends are then polished off with some 220 grit paper by hand. There was also some bark firmly attached at the end of one leg. This is scraped and paired off with a chisel before being evened out with some more hand sanding. The stick legs have no uniform surface, which is a problem when trying to get accurate setup results later. So I form one on each piece, which will become the inner facet for the legs when finished. With the reference faces established, the saw is carefully set up to create a planar, 10 degree angled cut at the end of each of the legs. With only one flat face, the pieces have to be clamped down and the second cut estimated to be planar with the first. The legs will be attached to the table by a dowel mortised into the leg and the top. The leg ends are marked out for a position in the approximate centre which will be used to transfer that location to the underside of the table with some dowel pins. The 
The hole for the dowel pin is larger than the centre of the Forstner bit, so the dowel's mortise is shallowly established first to allow full boring later. And here's a great shot of my wall. The dowel pin is pushed into its hole and the dowel's mortise only allows the very tip of the pin to protrude. The top now gets marked out to locate the legs. To avoid putting different centre holes in the slab, a piece of scrap plywood is taped down until a reasonable centre location is identified. Once this is done, the leg positions need to be worked out. They'll be spaced at thirds around the slab, and usually this is easily done by stepping the radius out six times and joining each second intersection to form an equilateral triangle. But the shape of the slab didn't allow for a full circle to be drawn and divided out, so I decided to use some trigonometry instead. I know the radius of the circle and the angle at each vertex of the triangle, so I can use these figures to calculate the three points for the table's top. With the side length now known, these get transferred onto the top and can then be connected to the centre point for the alignment of the legs. Siding the centre line of the legs onto the centre lines marked on the slab allow for good positioning and transferring of the dowel points from the leg to the slab. These dowel mortises can now be fully drilled out in the end of the legs and the underside of the table's top. And with the mark out basically completed, the temporary centre marker can now come off with some gentle persuasion. The dowel and forstner bit I had on hand weren't an exact match. The dowel could have been chamfered and driven home, but as both connections were end grain, I was concerned this would cause splitting. So the dowel's diameter was reduced using a flat pad and some sandpaper on the lathe, then docked to length and the cut ends dressed. The dowel's finished diameter has about two thou annular clearance in the mortises. This still allows for a firm fit, but reduces any chance of splitting. With the test fit confirming everything looks good, the mark out lines can come off, and I'm taking this opportunity to fill any small cavities that the flattening has exposed while more work continues on the legs. To ensure that everything goes together in the correct alignment and mortise during gluing, I'm adding a smaller locating dowel in a different position on each leg. This will ensure it's impossible to mix them up in the rush during gluing. These positions are then transferred and drilled out using the same method as before. I'm creating a glue escape groove in the dowels to ensure a full seating occurs when the joints are assembled during gluing. This will also help reduce the chance of splitting, as excessive pressure won't be created in the joint when clamped together. The remainder of the cleanup now starts. The last of the epoxy on the faces of the slab gets removed with a belt sander, and any excess on the edges gets paired off with chisels. The blue tape that was cast in on the edges gets cut out, and the shape of the epoxy filled bark split gets refined. The last section of the table's top gets polished to 1200 grit to ensure they're glass clear for the finish. A final test fit of the legs confirms the glue up can now begin. I'm adding some sizing glue to help seal the end grain of the legs and top. This is to minimise glue starvation when the joints assemble. Once the sizing mixture has had several minutes to soak in, the legs have the glue applied and the dowels fitted and hammered in. Glue can then be applied to the top and the joints are assembled and hammered home. The legs were clamped together with a sheet of plywood. This created an even downforce, not allowing the legs to splay outwards. While it created a good flat reference, eliminating the need for any scribing of the legs, it did show that the leg cuts weren't perfectly planar end to end. And to create the glass finish for the cavities, the underside was given a thin film of epoxy over the cast areas. Then the rest of the underside has a normal finish applied generously and burnished off. The top now gets the prep treatment, with the whole surface sanded to 220, the sharp edges broken and the cast sections polished to 1200 grit. I'm using a different epoxy for the top 
This variety is formulated as a top coat with better UV stabilisation and hardness characteristics, specifically for this application. For the first coats, only a small volume of epoxy is required for sealing the timber. Once the epoxy is poured out, it is mixed once more to ensure that both parts are thoroughly combined and then spread out thinly across the entirety of the top surface. These seal coats are important as typically the timber won't take the finish uniformly across the whole piece, especially in end grain. And it was at this point I realised I'd forgotten to put my maker's mark on the piece. <laughs> Luckily, I was able to sand off the thin film of epoxy and brand it on. Any later in the build, and this piece would have been getting a sticker only. And with that fire put out, the top is lightly sanded to 220 in preparation for another seal coat. The same process as before is adhered to, and I should note that a squeegee is better for these seal coats, but the trowel is all I had. Time to begin prep for the final flood coat. The bench, and more importantly, the legs, get masked off to stop any large volumes of epoxy spilling onto them, and the surface is now hit with 220 grit. For spreading and finishing this time, I'm using a 4mm notch trowel and a disposable paintbrush with any loose bristles removed. I picked up these finishing methods from Stonecoat Countertop's YouTube channel, so definitely check them out if you're looking for some great epoxy techniques. The notch trowel is used to create an even spread of epoxy over the surface of the slab, and it just works so well. This epoxy has a good working time, so there's plenty of time to get this uniform coating spread across the top and over the edges. Once that's had a chance to settle down, the brush is used to chop the surface randomly to eliminate any potential streaks left from the notch trowel and coat the edges while cleaning up the drips. It's important to prime the brush beforehand so it doesn't remove any of the epoxy from the surface during this process. Any remaining air bubbles in the finish now get removed by quickly running a map gas torch over the top. And this is done several times over the curing. A mirror finish. And the grain doesn't come up too bad either. I want the brace for the legs to be a minimum of 160 millimetres off the floor. So using this, I can employ a similar trig to earlier to calculate the size for the circular brace that will fit into this position. I'm going to be using copper pipe as I think it will complement the timber's colours while still maintaining a visually low profile. And I need to calculate the circumference of this circle and inner diameter of the ring to begin fabrication. Firstly, a form to bend the copper ring around needs to be constructed, and for this, I'm going with some plywood. I only had 12mm sheet on hand, so this necessitated laminating two parts together to produce a thickness suited to task. The circles were cut to a rough dimension, and the centre used for alignment to nail them together during gluing. With the glue set up, the clamps come off and the rough edges get dressed down to a uniform surface at the disc sander. This will make it easier to form the ring around later. I'm using 3 quarter inch soft drawn copper tube for the ring and to couple the two ends, I've decided to expand the pipe. Off the shelf couplings are available, but the expansion will keep the joint to the smallest it can for aesthetics. The expanders have a recessed lip that is used to slightly open the pipe end allowing the full jaw in. This tool then gets drawn together and the jaws further expand to create a socket to suit the pipe. My bending setup was pretty low tech, but definitely came through with the goods. Once the pipe was fully formed around the ring, it was marked and taken out of the jig. Forming the pipe without any shaped dies for support causes it to become slightly ovular. And this is clearly evident by the deformation the pipe cutters caused when cutting it down to length. And the pipe still had some spring in the ring, which will cause separation issues during brazing. So I tried punching the socket to keep it in place, but this wasn't quite enough, so I had to cramp it closed. And with that sorted, I can go back to cooking. 
The joint is heated to cherry red and the solder added. This is drawn into the joint via capillary attraction and once it's sufficiently filled and hardened, it's quenched with water. The oxidised surface of the pipe and the solder on the outside of the socket now get cleaned up. The bulk is done with abrasive papers, but a file with a safe edge is used to ride against the socket to clean it right into the corner. To further hide the joint, it will be fixed directly behind a leg, so it gets drilled and countersunk to accept a fixing screw. This hole is perfect to allow the ring to be suspended for finishing, so I'm getting that out of the way now. The ring is then sat into position and marked to drill the remaining two holes, which are done the same as before. The ring ended up about 5mm above the minimum ground clearance, which is great. So all that's left is to drill and screw them into position. Overall, I was pleased with how this project turned out. The only bugbear for me was the cast-in bubble, but I guess you get that on the big jobs. Thanks for watching, and I hope you enjoyed this project video as much as I did building it. See you later.